the ancient of days from every nation all of creation bow for the ancient of days every tongue in heaven and earth shall declare your glory every knee shall bow at your throne in worship you will be exalted oh Your kingdom shall reign over all the earth, sing unto the ancient of days. For none can compare to your matchless worth, sing unto the ancient of days. Every tongue in heaven and earth shall declare your glory, every knee shall bow at your throne. Exalted, O God, and your kingdom shall not pass away, O ancient of days, O ancient of days, O ancient of days. Well, good morning. Are you glad to be here? Well, good, good. Uh, my in-laws are here, Alan Kim Berry and uh, my sister-in-law, Casey Berry. Uh, Casey is a, a preschool minister down in, in uh, Houston and uh, took the day off. So uh, y'all be proud of a minister taking the day off and still being in church, you know. It's a good thing, good thing. All right, glad that you've chosen to be here. Uh, I want to warn you up front, this morning's message is not what you are probably going to expect from me, okay? Uh, the more of the preaching stuff is going to be about 10 minutes. Now, now, some of you might appreciate that, but I don't know. Uh, but there's going to be a pretty big history lesson, and I'm just up front with you to tell you I'm very nervous about it. I have a lot of reading type stuff that I want to do um, I think this election is a very important election that's coming up. I'm not about to stand here and tell you, you should vote for this person or this party or anything like that. I'm not going to do that. But I think we do need to recognize uh, where our founders intended this nation to be. I think we need to look at where we are. And then I think we need to vote based on biblical principles and a, a fine understanding of where each candidate stands. I sent some emails to you this week encouraging you to go on to some prayer gu or some voter guides and read how some of these candidates have answered questions related to things that are important to you and I in our Christian faith. Our religious liberties are under attack, and I'm going to present somewhat of a case for that this morning. And as why I believe it's important that I present a message like this this morning. So uh, we'll be in Romans chapter 13, but it's going to take us a little while to get there. But we're going to get there, so hang in there with me this morning. I pray that God will speak to your heart. I pray that God will speak to your heart towards what it means to be in subjection to the authorities, recognizing that God himself is our supreme authority. So... Let's take a few minutes, greet one another, and then we'll get back to our singing.
my father let's go to the lord in prayer father this morning as we do come together in this time of worship god i pray that this would not be a time of politics that lord we would not leave from this place somehow feeling um, as if we uh, came for some political rally because that indeed is not the intent of this time. But Lord, there is a long tradition in this country, even even before we were a country, of the pulpits specifically addressing the issues related to our nation, related to our government. Lord, I know that there are those who have already voted, but I know that there are others who will vote on Tuesday. Lord, there may be some who are saying, what's the point of voting? And so, God, I pray that this morning, that in this time that we come together, that we would understand that this nation was founded upon biblical principles. That this nation with its constitution and its bill of rights were set forth to operate under biblical principles. And God, we have moved far from where our founders ever intended this nation to be. And God, I will not blame the Republicans or the Democrats or anyone else. I blame us, the churches. I blame us, the preachers, for being unwilling to to stand for biblical principles even in the face of persecution. We have cowered and we ask your forgiveness. I pray, Father, that this morning that you would be with us. I pray that as this sanctuary will be open for the next couple of days, For people to come and to pray and to read and to study. That we would do that. That we would pray. That we would read. That we would study. That we would vote. According to biblical principles and not according to any one party. And so, Lord, we recognize the struggles that our nation is in. We recognize the eroding of our religious liberties. We recognize and acknowledge before you the gross immorality in this nation. And so, God, I pray that, God, we would do our civic duty to pray for our leaders, to vote according to biblical convictions, and to live our lives in such a manner that we reflect 
the truths of your word that we hold so dear. Father, we are blessed in this nation. We are blessed to have the freedoms that we have and we are blessed to have the opportunity to vote. You have blessed this nation. And so God, we come to you asking that you would give us guidance. Father, not only do we pray for the things that we are facing right now as citizens of the United States. But Lord, we also lift up those who are serving in various countries that do not experience the same freedoms that we experience. We pray for our missionaries serving around the world. We pray, Father, for those that we have a close relationship with and we know their struggles and we hear of their loneliness, we hear of their heartache, we hear of their exhaustion. And Lord, you know their names and the places in which they are serving. You know their needs far beyond what we do. And so we lift them up all around the world as they serve. to take the good news of Jesus Christ into the lost world. God, this morning we also pray for our military. We pray for those men and women who are serving this nation, who are serving under a commander-in-chief. So, Father, we recognize that this election affects so many of the men and women who serve this country so faithfully. We do pray for the protection of our military. We pray, Father, that you will be glorified in the work of the chaplains in spite of some of the difficulties that they have recently faced. We pray that our chaplains would be sources of light and hope strength and encouragement. And so God, this morning, as we recognize the need of the healing of this nation, we recognize what Solomon told us in Second Chronicles seven fourteen. that if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek your face, O God, and turn from our wicked ways. Then you will hear from heaven. You will forgive our sins and you will heal this land. And so, God, I pray that we as churches would not be complaining about presidents or judges. But we would be searching our own hearts. We would be repenting of our sins. And that we as churches, as Christian churches, would obey you, would submit to you, God, in all things. Give us your guidance and direction, O Lord. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Our hymn this morning is hymn 43. Please stand with me and let's sing. Oh. 
died shall be satisfied, and earth and heaven be one. Well, good morning. I have some good news for you. Hang on, hang on. All right. I have some good news for you. You might think that this is kind of strange what I'm about to say, but this good news is God did not create you as an old person. Are any of y'all surprised by that? God has done something absolutely amazing for us. You know, God knew that we could not handle being adults right from birth. God has given to us a very, very important gift. And I want you to listen to me. This is a very important gift that God has given us. God has given us parents who help to teach us how we can become adults making adult decisions. You know, one of the goals of your parents is to grow you up so that you can leave the house. Did you know that? They, they want you to grow up so that you can leave the house. That's right. That is right. But here's the thing. Right now as children, right now as children, we really have a hard time as children making good decisions. And I want you to know that your parents have actually been given the gift from God, the responsibility from God, to help teach you through His Word how to make good decisions. And my prayer for you is this, that when your parents might have to discipline you, or when your parents tell you that you need to clean your room, or you need to talk nicer, or some of those kinds of things that they're saying, I pray that you would not get angry with them for telling you to do those things, but you would recognize that they're just trying to train you to be good adults who are responsible, who make wise decisions, and who avoid making some really bad decisions that have some really bad costs to them. You know, with your parents, and when you come to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you receive the Holy Spirit living in you. And with the training of your parents, with the gift of the Holy Spirit with the Bible that you study each Sunday and Wednesday and hopefully at home as well, God is preparing you to be young men and young ladies who can go out into this world that does not always do the right thing and make good choices so that your life is pleasing to God. I pray that you would understand that. Pray with me. God, this morning... We thank you for how you use people in authority over us to teach us. May we all who are in authority over others recognize that we are under your authority, God. Help us to lead as parents in such a way that our children will love you, God, and obey you, God. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. You can go back to your seats. Before I sing, can I make a a public service announcement? (laughs) I got the microphone. No, when Brother Brent was talking about the, you know, going out and voting, I I just wanted to uh, encourage the women. You know, we haven't always had this right. We had to have women go out and march and file petitions and take ridicule from some men, some other women to get the right to vote, to to say, you know, I live in this country, I should have a vote in what we do. So don't take that privilege lightly. There was women that went out there and fought to earn this right for you. So if you don't know who to vote for, Brother Brent told you where to go and look it up and you'll you'll see. It's pretty clear. (laughs) And that has nothing to do with my song, so... (laughs) Is 
I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that I am God. Princess and paupers, sons and daughters, kneel at the throne of grace. Losers and winners, saints and sinners, one day we'll see his face, and we'll all bow down. Kings will surrender their crowns and worship Jesus. He is the unfailing love he is the love of God summer and winter the mountains and the rivers whisper the Savior Awesome and holy, a friend to the lonely, forever his love will reign, and we'll all bow down. Kings will surrender their crown. Jesus. Thank you, Miss Judy, uh, for sharing that with us. Uh, this morning, um, I'd like to begin with sharing uh, just a word with you from um, a hero of the faith, uh, Billy Graham. Um, he said, the legacy we leave behind for our children, grandchildren, and this great nation is crucial. As I approach my 94th birthday, I realize that this election could be my last. I believe it is vitally important that we cast our ballots for candidates who base their decisions on biblical principles and support the nation of Israel. I urge you to vote for those who protect the sanctity of life and the support of the biblical definition of marriage between a man and a woman. Vote for biblical values this November 6th and pray with me that America will remain one nation 
under God. Over the next couple of days, this sanctuary will be open during the regular, I guess, business hours, 8 to 5. You can come in. You don't have to go into the office and tell anybody you're here. Um, I'll have a few lights on in here. I'm going to have a notebook. Looks like this notebook because it will be this notebook. And a few other things down here that you can look at. Uh, I'm going to share with you about 11, um, a little more than 11, but basically 11 documents uh, for you to go and read yourself. I'm not reading everything in every one of these documents um, but um, I hope I'll answer a couple of questions for you. Tomorrow night at 7 o'clock, uh, we'll pray. Uh, if it's just me and my family, we'll pray. But we're going to come together and we're going to pray. Uh, we're going to ask God to forgive us, and we're going to ask God uh, to put the man in place that he wants to be in place as the president of our United States. Is it proper for me to preach an election sermon? Well, Reverend Barry Lynn of the Americans United for the Separation of Church and State would actually tell you that I should not be preaching this message today. Uh, Thursday, you can go to the website yourself, uh, au.com, or we'll just put in there Americans United for the Separation of Church and State. In one of his blogs called The Wall of Separation on November 1st, this is the first couple of lines of that blog. There are times when I think that we should just round up every church state attorney that we can find, fly them down to Texas, and start suing school districts until they behave. I realize Texas has a tradition for being stubborn. It used to be an independent republic, after all but things are getting out of hand. I'm sure you've seen some things in the news in reference to what he is speaking of. But there are groups such as the Americans United for the Separation of Church and State and any number of other organizations that I could tell you of. And of course, they did send me a letter along with pretty much every other evangelical pastor warning us of preaching any kind of message like this. So I've been warned. But groups like this work to distort the history as well as what our Constitution actually says. The Wall of Separation, as that blog is entitled. So what I want to do is to provide you with somewhat of a thorough discussion from the beginning about our U.S. history and about the impact of Christianity in the forming of the United States. First, let's deal with this aspect of the separation of church and state that is in our First Amendment, right? It's in our First Amendment, the separation of church and state. Let me read to you the First Amendment, and then I'll tell you where separation of church and state actually comes from, and I'll read to you the two letters related to it. Congress, this is our United States Bill of Rights. You can print it off yourself. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of the people to peaceably assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. Now, I didn't hear anything in that First Amendment that said anything about the separation of church and state. Now, I believe that amendment does say that the state will not impose a state-provided religion for us to follow. That is exactly where our founders desired that this nation be, because so many of our founders came from nations, England specifically, that required this particular practice of religion. So in 1801... October 7th, 1801, the Danbury Baptist Association in Connecticut wrote a letter to Thomas Jefferson, President of the United States at the time, and said this. I'll just read one portion of this, the whole document. You can read for yourself later. Our sentiments are uniformly on the side of religious liberty. 
that religion is at all times and places a matter between God and individuals that no man ought to suffer in name, person, or effects on account of his religious opinions and that the legitimate power of civil government extends no further than to punish the man who works ill towards his neighbor. Now, President Jefferson's response to that, of course, begins, uh, he responds to this on January 1, 1802. He begins with the regular acknowledgments of things, appreciate your encouraging words, all that good stuff. And then he says this, Believing with you that religion is a matter which lies solely between man and his God, that he owes account to none other for his faith or his worship, that the legislative powers of government reach actions only and not opinions. I contemplate with sovereign reverence that act of the whole American people which declared that their legislature would make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. He's quoting that First Amendment I just read to you. Now listen to what he says. Thus, building a wall of separation between church and state. Honestly, I wish he hadn't have said that because that's what's been taken out of context. Now listen to this. Adhering to this expression of the supreme will of the nation in behalf of the rights of conscience, I shall see with sincere satisfaction the progress of those sentiments which tend to restore to man all his natural rights, convinced that he has no natural right in opposition to his social duties. Now, in 1947, in the Supreme Court, U.S. Supreme Court, Everson versus the Board of Education, this is what their opinion gave. The First Amendment has erected a wall of separation between church and state, and that wall must be kept high and impregnable. We could not approve of the slightest breach. Now, I don't know if you noticed just a moment ago, but Jefferson's words ultimately said that there would should be a wall of separation between church and state, that the church should be free to exercise its, its opinions, its practices, believing that in so doing we would not violate the natural rights of God which is important to see. Jefferson's reference to natural rights invoked an important legal phrase which was part of the rhetoric of that day and which reaffirmed his belief that religious liberties were inalienable rights while the phrase natural rights communicated much to people then. To most citizens today, those words mean very little. By definition, natural rights included that which was of the books of the law and the gospel's that it does contain. That is, natural rights incorporated what God himself had guaranteed to man in the scriptures. Thus, when Jefferson assured the Baptists that by following their natural rights, they would violate no social duty, he was affirming to them that the free exercise of religion was their inalienable God-given right and therefore was protected from federal regulations or interferences. Now, I'll be honest to state this to you. I'm concerned about the free exercise of religion. I'm concerned about some of the religions that are out there because some of their practices go against our social laws, go against good social order and, and ill towards others. And so I'll be honest with you. There are some things that I might struggle with in our conversations about things. Uh, if you look at some of the nations that have come under the influence of Islam, there would be some things that would concern us in the free exercise thereof. So I want to point out to you that our Constitution, that our Bill of Rights was given based on the belief that we are a Christian and will practice as a Christian nation. So separation of church and state, it's not in your First Amendment. And if we'll read the documents well, we'll understand that Jefferson desired that we would be practicing our religion in the public square, not just in the four walls of the church. 
So were the founders Christians? People have questioned, were the founders Christians? Aren't they just deists? Don't they believe that there is some God that exists up there in the heavens somewhere, but he's really not involved with us here and now? John Hancock, the signer of the Declaration of Independence. John Hancock, in his last will and testament, wrote this. I, John Hancock, being advanced in years and being of perfect mind and memory, thanks be given to God, therefore calling to mind the mortality of man and knowing that it is appointed for all men once to die, Sounds like scripture to me, Hebrews 9.27. Do make and ordain this last will and testament principally and first of all, I give and recommend my soul into the hands of God that gave it and my body I recommend to the earth, nothing doubting but that the general resurrection I shall receive the same again by the mercies of the power of God. Benjamin Rush Signer of the Declaration of Independence. You tell me whether this sounds like a deist or whether it sounds like an evangelical Christian. My only hope of salvation is in the infinite, transcendent love of God manifest to the world by the death of His Son upon the cross. Nothing but His blood will wash away my sins. I rely exclusively upon it. Come, Lord Jesus, come quickly. I think is how your song ended. Sounds like Revelation 22 to me. Roger Sherman, signer of the Declaration of Independence, signer of the Constitution. I've got a whole bunch of these. You can read them. I believe that there is one only living and true God existing in three persons, the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost, that the scriptures of the Old Testament and New Testament are a revelation from God, that God did not send his own son to become a man, die in the room instead of sinners, and thus to lay a foundation for the offer of pardon and salvation to all of mankind so that all may be saved who are willing to accept the gospel offer. I don't know about you, but it sounds like evangelical Christians signing our Constitution and our Declaration of Independence, not just a deist who's out there somewhere with a God who's out there somewhere. Third, some say pastors should not be involved in government or politics. You ever heard that? Pastors ought not be involved. Don't talk politics to me, Pastor. You probably had somebody say, you shouldn't be talking politics, so. You ever heard of the Black Robe Regiment? The Black Robed Regiment. Um, David Barton is uh, with Wall Builders, and, uh, and I'll encourage you to, to Google Wall Builders. Uh, go to his website. Uh, a number of these documents that I read for you uh, comes from that website, uh, Great, incredible historian, um, written many books and well-documented. Uh, but David Barton was speaking Wednesday, October 31st, on uh, James Dobson's Family Talk, and he was speaking about the Black Robe Regiment, and, uh, and so this was uh, fresh for me as well. That's what the British called the American clergy during the American Revolution. The Black Robe Regiment is what the British called the American clergy during the American Revolution. John Adams stated this, that the pulpits have thundered. Historian Charles Galloway said that there's an incredible number of military generals in the American Revolution who were pastors. Historian J.T. Headley, in his book, Pastors and Clergy of the American Revolution, states that pastors were the strongest statesmen of their day. Let me give you a little bit of the Constitution story. 29 out of the 56 signers of the U.S. Constitution had seminary or Bible college degrees. When the 55 delegates met together for the Constitutional Convention, by the fifth week they were at gridlock. They were arguing with one another. They were fighting with one another. Benjamin Franklin calls for time out. Time out. We need prayer. We need some prayer. George Washington, read it for yourself from his diary, wrote in his diary, that for three days they went to church. When Benjamin Franklin said, time out, we need to pray. These delegates went to the church of Reverend William Rogers, and for three days they prayed, they studied, and the preacher preached to them. Ten weeks later, our Constitution was written. When the Constitution went to the states to be ratified... There were no state capitals, so where did it go? Went to the churches to be signed. So should I be preaching 
an election sermon? Well, election sermons were commonplace for ministers to preach not too very long ago. It was very common for a minister to be invited to give a sermon before the newly elected government officials. When they would convene on their first day to begin, it would begin with a pastor who had been selected to come and preach to them. In fact, the first election sermon was given in 1619 on Exodus 18.21. Listen to Exodus 18.21. Moreover, look for able men from all the people, men who fear God, who are trustworthy and hate a bribe, and place such men over the people as chiefs of thousands and hundreds and fifties and tens. That's a good word for today, isn't it? Let's put some men in government. Let's put some people in government. Let's put some women in government who fear God, who fear God and they're not willing to take a bribe. Trustworthy. You think we might ought to come back to that 1619 sermon message? 1674? in the midst of some real struggles within a community and the elections that were about to happen, the pastor stands up and he preaches a message entitled, The Cry of Sodom. Us preachers preach on some of these things too often on homosexuality. Well, they've been preaching on it at least since 1674 in this nation. I don't know why it's such a big deal if we preach on it today. 1681, The Role of Judges. We can go back to that message. That would be a good one for us to listen to. Religion and patriotism. Do you know that prior to the French and Indian War, the soldiers who were being prepared to go to war had preachers come and preach to them the Christian just war. You recognize that our military is asking all kinds of questions right now about why is the suicide rate so high in this nation among our soldiers? They're not being taught that there is just war. There is a time to kill. These Ten Commandment monuments sitting back here, I'll give you a testimony. When we went to the guy to have that thing inscripted and gave him how those Ten Commandments were to be written according to the New American Standard, he nearly teared up and he said, Is that what that commandment says? Yes, sir, that's what that commandment says. He said, I thought it always said, thou shalt not kill. No, sir. It says, thou shalt not murder. That's what that commandment says. And I wonder if that man coming home from Vietnam has struggled all of these years because he killed a man and he was never taught biblical just war. Maybe we need to get back to some of these sermons. And by the way, we shouldn't be naming candidates or anything, right? So in the 1800s, listen to this message. The voice of warning to Christians in light of the upcoming elections. I'm going to be honest with you. I'd love to have the opportunity of having either John Adams or Thomas Jefferson to vote for. I'm going to just be honest with you, okay? (laughs) Voice of warning to Christians in light of the upcoming election. Let me tell you what this pastor did. He said, this is what John Adams believes. This is what John Adams practices. This is what we've seen in the evidence of John Adams. This is what Thomas Jefferson practices. This is what Thomas Jefferson believes. This is what he's done. Now, this is what the Bible says, and this is who you should be voting for. They'd take away our tax-exempt status. I'm scared. (laughs) But 1947, the Supreme Court said, there's been a wall that has been erected between the church and state, essentially stating that religion must be practiced in the home or in the church, but not in the public. And in 1954, with the Johnson Amendment, stating that churches that are 501c3, that means that we're tax-exempt, that if we endorse any kind of political party, any kind of, there's all kinds of laws with it, then we will have our tax-exempt status removed from us There's a little over a thousand pastors who are preaching it, and they are calling America's United for Separation of Church and State and inviting them to come give them a lawsuit. And they won't do it because they believe it will be unconstitutional, and yet we're living as if it is constitutional. Slowly, 1962, Brother Oscar, I remember hearing you say, 
I never believed that they'd remove prayer from schools. That was as far from what I could ever think could happen. But in 1962, they removed prayer from our schools, slowly continuing to erode our religious liberties. Ten Commandments monuments being taken from courthouses and from schools and the public square. You know, just a few months ago, there was a church. And boy, I'm so tempted to move these Ten Commandments out to the road because there's a church that has a couple of these Ten Commandments monuments like this, but they've got it out at the road. And the road at the front of the church faces a public school. So that church in that city is being sued for them to remove those Ten Commandments because some of these children leaving the school might read some scripture and be swayed by the state to follow Christianity. Read it for yourself. The pledge has often been under the scrutiny to remove one nation under God. I have several other things, but as I look at my watch... You can read these for yourselves. Widow's prayer in a senior living center being asked not to pray because they receive government funds so she can only pray in her room and not in the common grounds of the area. Without dealing with some of the other things, I want to take you to one more thing before we go to the scripture. Was this nation founded to be a Christian nation? Daniel Webster was known as the defender of the Constitution. Statesman who argued cases before the U.S. Supreme Court served as a U.S. congressman, a U.S. senator, and a U.S. secretary of state. In 1820, when the state of man, uh, state of man, state of Maine separated from Massachusetts, a committee was called together to reevaluate the Constitution that had been written for the state of Massachusetts or the Commonwealth of Massachusetts in 1780. As this committee comes together, Mr. Webster cheers this committee. A report had come to the committee desiring to remove from its constitution that a profession of belief in the Christian religion is no longer required as a qualification of the office. So the constitution said that if you're going to hold public office, you must affirm the Christian faith. You must be a person who is of the Christian faith. Now, I want you to hear the words from Daniel Webster. He says this, however clear the right may be, I can hardly suppose that any gentleman would dispute it. The expediency of retaining the declaration is a more difficult question. It is said not to be necessary The phrase doesn't need to be in there. It doesn't need to be in there that you have to be a Christian. He says, I don't see that it's really necessary because the commonwealth, 99 out of every 100 of its inhabitants, profess to believe the Christian religion. So it's sufficiently certain, therefore, that the person of this description and none others will ordinarily be chosen in the place of public trust. State of Massachusetts, by the way. I am clearly of the opinion, he said, that we should not strike out of the Constitution all recognition of the Christian religion. I am desirous in so solemn a transaction as the establishment of the Constitution that we should keep in it an expression of our respect and attachment to Christianity, not indeed to any of its particular forms, but its general principles. Now, Thomas Jefferson, go to the Jefferson Memorial. You'll read around the dome. I have sworn upon the altar of God eternal hostility against every form of tyranny over the mind of man. There are four panels in that, uh, in that memorial area. And I want to read the third panel to you, just a few words from the third panel. Was this nation founded to be a Christian nation? Yes. On Thomas Jefferson's memorial, God who gave us life gave us liberty. Now listen to this sentence. Can the liberties of a nation be secure when we have removed the convictions that these liberties are the gift of God? Thomas Jefferson said this nation was founded upon the convictions of biblical principles. Can we truly be a nation of liberty if we don't recognize this fact? He said, indeed, I tremble For my country, when I reflect that God is just 
and his justice cannot sleep forever. John Adams wrote a letter to Benjamin Rush in 1809. And listen to this. But my friend, there is something very serious in this business. The Holy Ghost carries on the whole Christian system in this earth. Not a baptism, not a marriage, not a sacrament can be administered but by the Holy Ghost. That's better than some Baptist theology there. There is no authority civil or religious. There can be no legitimate government but that which is administered by this Holy Ghost. There can be no salvation without it. Good Baptist there. Although without it is rebellion and perdition, in more orthodox words, damnation. I don't think that we can take religion out of this nation for which it was founded. Let me read to you something from the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania in 1824. You tell me whether this sounds like something coming from our Supreme Courts. No free government now exists in the world unless where Christianity is acknowledged and is the religion of the country. 1824... You can read it for yourself if I can give you the documentation for this, but no free government now exists in the world unless where Christianity is acknowledged and is the religion. Benjamin Rush, who I just spoke of just a few moments ago, also a signer of the Declaration of Independence, said this, the only foundation for a useful education in a republic is to be laid in religion. Without this, there can be no virtue. Without virtue, there can be no liberty. And liberty is the object of life and of all republican governments. Now, let's go to Romans chapter 13 for just a moment. Romans chapter 13. And I do know what time it is, so I told you from the start this part's going to be a little bit shorter. You've got, you've got it to read for yourself over the next couple of days. Romans chapter 13. Be subject to the governing authorities. This is our text this morning. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God. And those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed. And those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval. For he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain, for he is the servant of God, an avenger of who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer, Therefore, one must be in subjection not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For because of this, you also pay taxes. For the authorities or ministers of God attending to this very thing pay to all what is owed to them. Taxes to whom taxes is owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, honor to whom honor is owed. By the way, this was written for those in Rome. Pray with me. Father, this morning, speak in the few moments that we have left to our role of being in subjection to those who are in authority over us. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. First, there's no authority except from God. Clearly, Paul states this. Now, he's speaking to those Jews, those Christians who are, who are in the midst of a corrupt Rome. He's not addressing the corruption of Rome. He's not addressing the problems of Rome. He's not addressing any of those things. But he is saying that there is no authority except from God. All governing authorities are subject to God. Understand that. 
I don't care whether our present people will say, who do we vote for? We don't have a Christian president for either one of them. And, and I've got some, we're not going there right now except to tell you, read for yourself. I believe that's a true statement. We don't have the choice of two Christian presidents to choose from. But they are subject to God. I don't care whether they're Christian or not. Everyone in authority, in any manner of civil government of such, are under the authority and are to be subject to God. God has allowed all governing authorities to exist and to be put into power. Have you ever thought about Babylon for a moment? Babylon was a wicked, wicked nation, power, authority. Do you realize that God used Babylon to bring correction to his people, Israel? We complain sometimes about who's in power, but I want you to know something. God's putting in power who needs to be in power. And some of us aren't voting to help the matter either. If we resist God's governing authorities, we will incur judgment. Let me ask you to think back for just a moment. Actually, turn back to Acts. Turn back to Acts. Because here's the reality. We are no longer in a nation that respects us as Christians. Okay? There are some very positive things, and I know I, in talking with some of our police officers, there are some things that they have faced as struggles. If the law ever comes to this point that they have to come do some of the things that are potential in the future, if things don't change, it's going to be a hard thing for them ever to face arresting a pre preacher out of his pulpit. But I want to call your attention back for just a moment to Acts chapter 4, verses 13 through 20. Remember that Peter and John uh, healed and, uh, and preached in the name of Jesus, and boy, it just stirred up those who were in authority. Now listen to Acts chapter 4, verse 13. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John perceived that they were uneducated, common men, they were astonished, and they recognized that they had been with Jesus. Now by the way, the world ought to be recognizing that we've been with Jesus. I mean, that's just, that's gravy right there. But seeing... The man who was healed, standing beside them, they said they had nothing to say in opposition. But when they had commanded them to leave the council, they conferred with one another, saying, What shall we do with these men? For, for that a notable sign has been performed through them is evident to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem and cannot be denied, but in order that it may not spread any further among the people. Let's warn them not to speak anything about Jesus anymore. So they called them together and they charged them not to speak or to teach at all in the name of Jesus. Now listen to what Peter says. And Peter and John answered them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than God, you must judge for we cannot but speak what we have seen and heard. They were further threatened and then released. Turn over to the next chapter, Acts chapter 5. And listen to these words in Acts chapter 5. This time in Acts chapter 5, we're in a, another situation of, of arrest. And, and we're in a, in a point here uh, in which, uh, again, just, just the threat to Peter and to the apostles. Threat of being stoned. Now in Acts chapter 5, beginning in verse 27. And when they had brought them... And by the way, they had been arrested and then God freed them and they're back to preaching, just setting that in context a little bit. They go back because they can't find them in jail and they find them preaching out in the public square. And when they had brought them, they set them up before the council and the high priest questioned them saying, we strictly charge you not to teach in this name. Yet here you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and you intend to bring man's blood upon us. But Peter and the apostles answered, we must obey God rather than men. Now, we're not going to deal so much with us in the midst of a nation that is, doesn't seem to be so much in favor of Christianity. I want to say to you that there's no authority except from God. You want that point made clear? Go to Acts chapter 12. 
Herod had beheaded James, the brother of John. Peter was arrested. Peter was freed. Herod got all mad, claimed himself to be God, and God gave him a few worms in his belly, and he died. You tell me who's in authority. It wasn't Herod. Second point, the purpose of governing authorities. Very clearly, in Acts chapter 13, verses 3 and 4, the purpose of governing authorities is that there is to be no fear for those of good conduct. But those of bad con conduct, there ought to be fear. They don't bear the sword in vain. They are servants of God to carry out God's wrath. Now, I challenge you, go read your Declaration of Independence. It's here. I'll highlight a few things for you. The issue with our nation, with with the free men here in this United States before it was a United States while it was under the rule of England. The issue was the government, the history of repeated injuries, all having a direct establishment of absolute tyranny over the states. That's a part of what is written in that, in that Declaration of Independence and as you come to the end, it says, in every stage of these oppressions, we have petitioned for redress in the most humble terms. Our repeated petitions have been answered only by repeated injury. A prince whose character is thus marked by every act which we may define a tyrant is unfit to be a ruler of free people. Now, I'm going to tell you, we are to be subject to those who are in authority over us. There does come a time, even as this Declaration of Independence says, when in the course of human events, it becomes necessary. You see, these men and women as founders of this nation saw it necessary to die to secure our biblical freedoms. To secure that this nation would be one nation under God. And when the government is no longer being a terror to those who are bad, but being a terror to those who are good, we've got some problems here. Verses 5 through 7, what's your civil duty? I'm not going to stand up here and tell you not to pay taxes. I know all of you were hoping I was going to say that. Don't pay your taxes. Pay your taxes. Respect and honor those who are in office. Vote. Vote. One last word from verse 5. Verse 5 says this, Therefore one must be in subjection. When I said to you, vote, I want to ask you to vote in subjection to Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Not in subjection to a political party. Not in subjection to a preacher telling you who you should vote for. But vote in subjection to God who is the authority over this nation over this pastor, over this church, over your family. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then this morning, do you need to come and receive Him? Right at four years ago, there was a person from this church, and I'm not going to, to give any information to you, but a person of this church came to my office, and this person with tears in this person's eyes, said, help me, preacher. Help me. Who should I vote for? I have always voted a particular way. And as I have studied some of the things that have been made available out there, voters' guides and such, I can't vote the way I voted in the past, and I just don't know whether it's right or not. You know, I want to encourage you. Study. 
pray. Maybe pray again. Vote in subjection to Jesus Christ. Pray with me. Father, this morning it seems maybe a little out of place to have an invitation right here. But Lord, there may be some people who do not know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. They've never gone to a voter's booth as a Christian. But God, this morning, maybe you have been dealing with their hearts over these last few weeks. Maybe you have been dealing with their hearts for many years now. And they need to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And this morning, they know that they need to surrender to you. Not because the preacher has preached anything moving towards doing so, but because your Holy Spirit is the one who is speaking to their hearts. And so I want to give that opportunity of invitation this morning. Maybe, God, in this invitation, not only are there those who need to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, but maybe there are those who need to simply come to this altar and bow and say, I don't want to be ignorant when I vote. I don't want to vote just for name only. I want to know where a candidate stands. I want to know where a party platform stands. And I want to make a decision that is biblical, that as closely as possible follows biblical principles. And so God, this morning, Maybe there are some who just need to simply come and bow and say, God, I surrender to you this morning that I'll go home and do the work that I need to do in prayer and in study before I make an important vote. And so, Lord, in this invitation, I pray for your will to be done. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Won't you stand? We're going to sing, I've decided to follow Jesus. How do you need to respond? I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. Turning back, no turning back. Though none go with me, I still will follow. Though none go with me, I still will follow. Though none go with me, I still will. You can be seated if our ushers will come forward.
in Jerusalem, and also resides in two places, so much child and child will approach you keep her safe, and keep the honor and the name. Okay, very good. So just a quick word. Many wonderful books in our library uh, for us, and so the library is open before and after uh, church time, so go and be a part of that. A uh, reminder to you, fi- uh, from 8 to 5, uh, Monday and Tuesday, uh, you can come into this sanctuary and to pray and to do some study. And I'll have several things out here uh, with this notebook. Uh, just flip through those things, look through those things, uh, pray through those things, allow those things to be guides for you. Uh, in prayer, 7 o'clock tomorrow night, we'll meet in here for pray, uh, for prayer, those of you who can make it. At 4 o'clock, our children's ministry team uh, will be meeting today. You've got several uh, missions opportunities uh, upcoming. Our shoe boxes, I think, if I got the report right this morning, uh, we're, we've got all the shoe boxes except 25 uh, ready to go. And so uh, if uh, you would like to give towards that, then that's uh, also an opportunity for you. Uh, Some Thanksgiving baskets. I think our ladies' class is kind of working with those Thanksgiving baskets, and so uh, see some of the ladies from that ladies' class about that. In on the table back there, sign up sheets for our pictorial directory. Um, If you would like to have your picture in the pictorial directory, then you need to get signed up back there. We'll update information, all that good stuff. Please get signed up over this week and then next week, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, will be times to be taking pictures. Ms. Teresa Ashley's taking pictures. Um, and so uh, thank you, Ms. Teresa, uh, for doing that. Was there anything I was supposed to announce from the youth or I don't think so? Good. All right. I've kept you long enough. Hey, by the way, I heard somebody say, Jesus is not on the ballot. If he was, that's who I'd be voting for. So you pray and you vote. John, would you close us with prayer?